Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana. And uh, tonight's guest is Charlie Schott. And we are going to talk about a new program that he is starting in uh, the New London Public Schools. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you. This is really the first I am learning about the program also. So it's, um, it's kind of a treat for me, too, to learn about something like brand new that's coming to, to our town. Um, but before we talk about the program, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in, in this sort of activity. How far back do I go? As far as you want. We have <laughs> almost an hour, so you can go back to like when you first entered kinder the kindergarten doors <laughs> if you want. For the first time, because I... Entered them again about <laughs> uh, seven years ago when we started this program. I had uh, recently retired from um, IBM, and uh, my wife uh, retired from her business, sold her business, and uh, we wanted to do some volunteering together, and we wanted to do it with kids. And we knew uh, a principal of uh, one of the inner city schools in Danbury. And uh, we went to him and told him what we wanted to do and asked if he would talk to one of his teachers and see if they might like a couple of folks to <laughs> help them in the, in the classroom. And uh, the first uh, teacher to raise her hand was a kindergarten teacher. Um, she had 33 years in as a kindergarten teacher at that point. And uh, we said, well, great, you know, we'll do that. I uh, am a math science guy and I was thinking, well, you know, I kind of like to do the older kids, uh, but I'll start in kindergarten. And uh, I was there about two weeks, and I say, I'm going nowhere. I mean, these kids are a delight. Little intellectual sponges, um, no social filters, you know. You know. <laughs> well, I'm actually a retired preschool teacher. Oh, ah, there you go. Um, and though I was not myself a math science person, many of my family members are. And, um, you know, the other thing about very young children is that they are kind of natural scientists. They are, well, they are. they're exploring the world and, and they're figuring things out and drawing conclusions from what they're experiencing. And they're probably better scientists than 95% of the adults out there. <laughs> yeah, they don't acquire all their biases and preconceptions. <laughs> and exactly. So uh, it was an absolutely wonderful experience. We went in kind of lighthearted. Wouldn't it be nice to spend a few hours a week with some kids? All of our grandsteads are several states away. But we soon realized, wait a minute, we were becoming important, caring adults in these kids' lives. and. Uh, um, we really took it on as a, as a mission, uh, being mentors to these kids, and it was incredibly gratifying for us to see the progress the kids were making. It was a huge help to the teacher. They had recently lost a lot of their para-educators. Now, how big were the classes? Well, it, they were 25 when we came in. That's a Not pretty big class for a single teacher. For one teacher in a kindergarten, it's and of almost course, and impossible. And we're talking a city school, so yes. you, some of the students were living in poverty Oh, as this well. was a Title I school. The majority of the families were below the poverty level. And um, uh, English second language was over 50% of the kids. Um, so it was, a, it was a huge help. We really formed wonderful relations with the kids. 
because we were there, we were doing a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, small group activity that the teacher couldn't possibly do. So we gave her the flexibility and the resources to actually do a better job of teaching in the classroom. So it, it was a win-win-win. I mean, the, primarily the kids. Um, and a great help to the teacher. And uh, all of the volunteers, well, we said, and all of the subsequent volunteers said, hey, this is one of the best things I do all week, or sometimes this is the best <laughs> thing I do all week. So it, it was great. So you started out just you and your wife volunteering. Uh, the program obviously expanded from there. <laughs> uh, it did. We realized the need was so great the effect we had was so helpful for the teacher and the kids, and it was so gratifying for us personally. We said, we've got to expand this. So we went back to our UU congregation of Danbury and uh, had a couple sessions over the summer. I said, we should go in there as a group and really see what a group of volunteers can do in that school. So we marched in with 16 volunteers in the fall and um, added some more over the next couple of years. And the uh, test scores were going up. Uh, the principal was fond of saying, when my staff, when my teachers see that you volunteers think what we do here, is important enough for, to, for you to come and help. That just lifts the vitality and spirit of the whole school. And uh, we said that we need to take this to other schools. So I went to our uh, local Danbury interfaith group called ARC, Association of Religious Communities. And I said, I think this is you know, under your purview, let's see if we can form a program under ARC. I presented to the board. They said it absolutely is under our mission, so do it. So I ran that program until this past uh, June when we uh, moved to Mystic. So that was about six years worth of running that program. So yeah. did yeah. it ex how much did it expand? Did it stay within that one school and uh, different classrooms or? Uh, it did, and to four other schools. Oh. And when I left in June, there were 78 volunteers oh working in five schools. And I, I saw the woman who uh, took over for me. I was actually up there this weekend. And we've added a six, six school. Um, it also was a... Um, kind of a catalyst for other activities. We had an amazing Girl Scout troop join us as a program they set up, Kids for Kids. The program's name was Kids. It was an acronym for Kids in Danbury Schools. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so they had Kids for Kids. They raised funds for two years in a row, the last two years, for uh, 380 odd uh, backpacks and pencil boxes for all of, all of the graduating kindergartners in those five schools. Wow. And they started an after school volunteer program. A lot of the schools have an extended learning program uh, where Kids have some additional learning, play some games and what have you, frankly, so their parents can finish their jobs and come and pick them up. Yeah, I, I worked for Head Start for, for 12 years as yeah. a home visitor, and one thing that really struck me with the families who are you know, beyond, you know, below the poverty line is that the parents so frequently worked several minimum wage jobs. That's right. And they worked very erratic hours, and it made like real family time almost impossible because, you know, if it was a two-parent family, they'd stagger their shifts so one could be with the children, or 
it, 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 their lives were really um, not relaxed at all. No. You know, contrary to, to some mythology people hear about poor people, these people, you know, parents were working 60, 70 hours a week to, to make ends meet. But things like family meal times and family outings really suffered. They did. I mean, I certainly found uh, there was a lot of very strong family connections with the kids, but not that much time. There often was a, a grandmother or an aunt, and they had to work collectively to you know, manage the kids and the time and the meals. Um, this is a little bit of a off tangent, perhaps, but you mentioned that many of the students uh, came from homes where English was not the first language. So right. um, is that a center for a lot, um, a lot of Im immigrants to settle in yes. Danbury? Yes. We have a very strong Hispanic uh, population in, in Danbury. Most of the schools um, are in the neighborhood of 60%. Not that different from the demographics in New London, That's I right. think. That's right. I discovered that. That's right. I, I think it's, it's pretty similar. It's funny, when I worked for Head Start, I had that, but also a lot of families with different languages. One year, I, I had 12, 11 or 12 students because it was a home program. Uh, we'd only bring the children together a couple times a week for a couple hours for a social time. but. For, in several years, I had so many different home languages that the children were bringing. I mean, of course, English, of course, Spanish, a Haitian Creole, mm -hmm. large population in New London, uh, Urdu, uh, Pakistanis, a lot mm -hmm. of Pakistani immigrants. And then we had you know, some from India, some from uh, the Philippines, some from Guam, some from... Not, not Guam itself, but some of the other islands in the area, um, some from Africa. There was, yep. It was incredible how many different languages, but those families were in some ways the most, ha, had the most strong family ties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they needed that. Yeah. So, over here, I, I heard that in Danbury High School there were 24 different languages. Yeah, spoken, it doesn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. So yeah, so you brought some slides, and I think maybe we'll, you know, show the slides and talk a little bit about sure. what they are. Sure. So, okay, New London Kids Program, and I don't know. I guess the D doesn't stand for Danbury. We'll have to figure out what it is. Oh, we just we forgot it's, the uh, left, yeah. left the acronym behind. Now it's just the Kids Program. Yeah, I guess if it was New London, it would have to be the Kids Program. <laughs> that isn't quite right. Okay, so a summary uh, of the program. Um, yeah, and the slides is a community. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you can it read up. it. I have the yeah, we have the slide oh, up. Okay. Sure. But then we can talk about it. Uh, a community volunteer program to bring additional volunteers into elementary classes in New London schools to assist teachers and mentor yeah. students. So, so, so that's the thumbnail. If you look at the next slide, um, as I mentioned before, having those volunteers gives the teacher tremendous flexibility and allows a lot of the one-on-one -on -one and small group activity to happen that just wouldn't happen elsewhere. So it's a real boon to the teacher and her teaching. And this might actually be more true in New London today than it was in Danbury seven years ago because by contract now, uh, elementary school classes, uh, a teacher can have tw up to 28 students. Um, and when you know, we have new school construction going on, and when the specifications for the new schools are being created, that contracted number is partly what determines how many classrooms are being built. So Whoa. because it's a big, uh, the ratio is poor, um, a school that's built in New London might have fewer classrooms built for the same number of students as a school in Waterford next door or, mm -hmm. you know, East Lyme a couple of towns down just because it is part of the contract that we can have up to 28 students. So that's, you know, I can imagine that the teachers 
would be are, are going to be every bit as appreciative in New London, yeah, very, if not more. Very much so. And uh, occasionally there'll be a second volunteer in, or what Danbury did when there was a special needs student, they had a teacher with them all the time, and she became a de facto other right. set of arms and legs in the classroom. So all of the adult resources kind of work together to, uh, yeah. you know, to make it happen. I think they would have, have to do that. Now to provide students with a stronger foundation for their academic careers and their lives. And now you said that your background, and you worked for IBM, it's math and science. Um, are there any particular kinds of academic backgrounds that you look for in volunteers or? No, no. no. A desire to work uh, with the children. Um, obviously, uh, if they have, they have a second language, uh, not a great deal of math expertise is required in kindergarten, but the curriculum yeah. has expanded amazingly over the last Yeah, kindergarten uh, seven, has gotten a little bit more academic than I, as a preschool teacher, yeah. would well, like. I mean, they're doing and, algebra in, in yeah. kindergarten. Yeah. How well, many I hope bananas do you have to add if you have four to get to six, you know? You know, and <laughs> I'm feeling I'm like, wow, in that age, even, you know, preschool through kindergarten or even first grade, just like having materials in the environment, of course, that give people those concepts, uh, but when it gets to be a drill rather than an exploration, I, I do worry a little bit about whether that's the best way that young children can learn. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of controversy that I heard among the teachers. The whole socialization, learning through playing and what have you, and then learning for the test and you know everything in between. Yeah, so. and hopefully we can do everything we need to, but I, I, I do worry a little, but I imagine that the more you have, you know, adults, extra adults doing one-on-one -on -one kind of things and, and games that, you know, that, that, that enhance thinking skills. Um, it does, and, and it really thing. showed up all the schools that got volunteers. There was a marked improvement in the test scores just because the kids had that additional exposure. Um, so it really helped. Well, you know, I think about like reading outcomes and you know, how kids learn to read and you know, in the early years, having environmental print in, in the room, in their homes, and having access to a lot of books from the time they're born, uh, and whether they're read to, and whether it's a pleasant interactive experience that they're read to frequently, is really huge in like how well they will learn to read and how much they enjoy reading in, in, into the future. So it isn't surprising that you know it, the test scores get to be well. Yeah, I know this anyway, so the test isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, rather than oh, I have to learn this so I do okay in the test. Yeah. The uh, the extra one and one. I uh, think of one young boy from uh, Ecuador, uh, this was our third year, I believe, Joel, uh, he came in no numbers, no, no letters, no, no English. English. Yeah. At the end of kindergarten, now he was a very bright kid, hmm. but at the end of kindergarten, with a lot of help, he was reading and writing paragraphs in English. Wow. Well, I, I have to admit I marvel at young children's brains when it mm. comes to the ability to learn languages. <laughs> I worked with some three-year-olds who had not known a word of English before they started the program. And in some cases, it, perhaps a, a parent or a grandparent was in the house who also didn't know English. And the three-year-olds would translate. And, and the three-year-olds would know that to speak English to me and Spanish or Creole, 
to dad or to grandma. Without, without even thinking about without it. Without hardly thinking. It's like these kids are all geniuses compared to me when it comes to languages. <laughs> yeah, we missed our... Uh, yeah, we missed that uh, developmental uh, window or if we didn't uh, get it already. <laughs> I often tell the story of when I was in school, we had a, uh, a German cook at our uh, fraternity and uh, she spoke some broken English. Her husband, who was also German, spoke none. They had a son in his 20s and he married um, an Italian gal, for first generation, and her parents came over. Uh, I guess she came over to school here. Her parents came over. The young couple had a, a boy. When I met him, he was four or five. Uh, Italian, German, English, without even thinking about it. Yeah. He was the communication link between the grandparents. It is amazing. <laughs> uh, it makes me think that it, it's too bad that in the United States we're not naturally yes. so exposed to different languages and different contexts from a very young age because I think our brains were meant to do that. Yes, and it's very good for yeah. your brain when you do. It, it, it is, and, and I think it probably does help other things as well. So let's talk a little bit. You talked a little bit about the program history. So you started in Danbury. You said 16 volunteers the first year? First year. And then we added to that. And we said we have to expand it. And uh, uh, so in uh, 2014, we did uh, have three Title I schools. Uh, our partner in the school district was the uh, deputy superintendent, who was a wonderful uh, oh. gentleman. So the the director of our interfaith superintendent and I were kind of the trio that got this thing going and kept it growing. And uh, now, how many hours typically did a volunteer spend in the classroom? We, we asked for two hours a week. Now, some people would spend a day. I actually spent two days for several years, uh, two, two and a half hours. Um, two hours a week is not a huge uh, right. commitment uh, or a lot to ask, but we do say if you volunteer, do it. A lot of these kids have enough disappointments, you don't have to be one of them. Uh, yeah. you know, so it's, show up. it's not a huge commitment, but it's a real commitment. Yes, that's right. Good way to put it. So let's see a little more about the history. Um, we discovered, and I think I put this on a later slide, we, we wanted to do more and more schools. and We needed more and more volunteers. So we had uh, luncheons every fall. And fortunately, our local newspaper uh, picked up and did a number of articles. And we had people coming out of the community, and they said, you know, I've wanted to do something like this for years, and I didn't know where to go. Uh, do, I, do I just go walk to the school down the street and say, hey, can I help? Or, and so it was wonderful to provide a, a vehicle or a channel. For yeah, because people. you can't really just walk, to, <laughs> walk can't. into, especially now, you really can't just walk into yeah, a school a, and say, I want to volunteer. That's right. So there's a vetting program for the volunteers, and um, uh, but it was um, we were amazed at the number of people that wanted to do it. So we were able to go from 16 volunteers and 22 up to the high 70s. And it keeps expanding, even though you've moved to this part of the state. Yes, hopefully. Yes, they added another school. <laughs> So w what we did, um, we actually, over those years, we developed a very good template for how to do this. We have a very detailed uh, volunteer guide, the do's and don'ts, a guide for the, for the teachers. What do you do initially? You know, let, let them kind of shadow you. Uh, 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 suggestions and what they can do as they get to know one another, teacher and volunteer. And what happens over two and three years, you just develop this 
strong partnership between volunteers and the teacher and they know what each other's skills are and they just work seamlessly and it's, uh, as I said, very rewarding for the volunteers. So what kind of personal stories have you heard back from either volunteers or teachers or kids over the last you know, oh my God. five, six years? <laughs> there, there's so many. I, I do think of a fellow uh, two years ago who uh, was associated with ARC and the appearance maybe of a curmudgeon and we said, look, you know, there aren't many men. Why don't you, uh, why don't you try volunteering, you know, with the kids, you know, first kindergarten, first grade. Well, we said, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I heard this the, uh, the, the day after he started and he came back and he told everybody about his experience. He went in to the classroom and met the teacher and introduced to the kids and they had to go from classroom into uh, media. So they have to go down the hall and so he's coming along and uh, one little girl comes up and takes his hand and then pretty soon another one comes and he's walking down the hall, <laughs> and I mean, he just melded. Into <laughs> <laughs> and he told everyone, and he was just, I mean, he just loved it. It just opened him up, and uh, I mean, he's been a great volunteer ever since. Wow. Oh, it there's so many, and so many of the kids just did so well. Um, and it probably is really nice to have another adult there who isn't, I mean, the teacher has to spe spend a lot of time just managing the classroom and making sure, you know, everything runs smoothly for everyone. And, you know, with the large class sizes, can't really just sit and relax and play a game one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. So this is something that's really valuable for the, for the students. Yeah. Uh, no question about it. And what we uh, say in the in the volunteer guide, the teacher is given the students that she's to teach. She is given the curriculum that she is to teach. Johnny may not be as well behaved as Susie, but uh, do what the need is at the moment in the classroom. Help the teacher. It's her classroom help her in any way uh, that you can and that she asks. Um, oh, yeah. 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 And um, um, I, ju I just thought of okay. one thing I have to tell you. I went back okay. uh, this fall uh, into the classroom, the kindergarten classroom, and of course I have had kids in every grade there from kindergarten through fifth grade. And one of the other teachers uh, I, I worked with over the years heard I was coming back and she said, well, you know, come on up and say hello. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, I went up and knocked on the door and I saw her and waved and she said, oh, come on in. I walk in, she gives me a big hug. <laughs> And then all the kids, hi, Charlie, it's Charlie. <laughs> and uh, I, I went by Charlie, not Mr. Chud. And, and they let you do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they ask you, what would you like to be called? Um, and she said, okay, um, students, you can line up and you can each give Charlie a hug. <laughs> so every student wow. in the fourth grade. And I couldn't walk down the halls. None of the volunteers could without getting a, a hug or a high five. Or, I mean, it's just wonderful. You become part of the whole fabric of the school, and that's uh, and part of the satisfaction. And it's more and more of you. Okay, so we have, I guess, one more slide about the program history. Um, and it, this part is really about the impact on the volunteers. Yes. And if, first of all, we gave them a channel to do 
to be caring adults for these children and we become mentors in their lives. Uh, uh, and I found that here. I, I had a, a woman Sunday before last come up and said, you know, I've wanted to do this with some kids and I didn't know how to do it. I'm so glad you're doing this. She said, sign me up. Now, so, do you find it's mostly retirees who are looking for this? Mostly. This, this girl has uh, children of her own um, in school, but she wanted to do something like that. So she would be the exception. Um, we had maybe 20% were retired teachers, mm -hmm. and they all said something like, this is why I went into education. I don't have to do any prep. <laughs> I don't have to write any reports, and I don't have to go into any meetings. I'm just one-on-one -on -one with those kids. And so they loved it. It was like busman's holiday for them. Yeah, really. <laughs> I can imagine that. And then you have a slide here, a, a quote from a, a school principal. Oh, we and ought to read that. He says it better than... Okay. Well, oh, me... read it. Uh, you want to read? Well, sure, I'll I... read it. Let's see if we can... Okay, this was uh, by the principal of the first school. We just have to be careful we don't lose our connection. Okay. I think it's okay. I think my classes will reach. This is the quote. Our volunteers have been a blessing to our school in so many ways, so many levels. First and foremost, it's benefited our students. Um, they have had one-on-one -on -one time in vol with volunteers in various academic areas that they would not otherwise have had, and this has enhanced their, te their education. Um, the staff and the teachers benefit uh, from the additional help, which allows them to be a, do a more effective job of teaching. And teaching is a challenging career. When each of our volunteers think that what we do here is important enough that they should come and help it only raises the vitality and spirit of the whole school. Now, beyond academics, the students form meaningful relationships with other caring adults who show them that they matter in this world. Our volunteers are making positive differences in lives needing it most. To personally witness on a daily basis the exuberance with which the children greet their volunteers is an emotional, heartwarming experience. Now, that's the principle. Yeah, that's great. And that's the principle of one of the schools. Yes. So let's talk about um, what's happening now in New London. Now that you have a model for success in Danbury, you've moved to Southeast Connecticut, um, and I can see... Um, your first school is Harbor. Yes, yes. So tell us about what it's, um, the program is looking like at, at Harbor. I'm guessing um, if you just moved here in fall and it's January, it's really just still starting out. Yes, yeah, we hope we'll start this, this spring. Uh, I met with the superintendent, the new superintendent, uh, with Myrna who was very supportive, as you can imagine. Um, the superintendent has suggested the Harbor School. It's a very old, proud school, started in 1907. And uh, they're starting this fall with a whole STEAM program, STEM and Arts STEAM okay. program. And they've got a new principal, so they're going through a bit of a renaissance the school, oh. so it would be ideal to bring some volunteers in and, and help with that. And I'm thinking that that's the school that has the generally youngest population of students. It started mm -hmm. out, I think, just pre-K, kindergarten, and grade one, and and it's added the the, the older grades. Yes. But I think it's still a little bit younger student population than the other elementary schools. So. Yeah. For a variety of the reasons the superintendent said, this, this is a place to start. So I've met with uh, the, the principal, uh, Jason Foster, and uh, the vice principal, uh, Lois uh, Andrahan, and uh, they're very excited about the program. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to have the kickoff in two days. 
uh, Thursday night at All Souls Congregation, 19 J Street, 7 o'clock, 7 to 8.30, and uh, uh, we'll take people through, uh, tell them about the program, have a Q&A session, and hopefully get some people uh, that tell us they want to join us and, and be part of that program. And if people see on the screen, there's contact information if anyone uh, wants more information about it. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, I'm glad you mentioned All Souls because the person who first, like, you know, made the introduction between you and me was um, Mike Stevens, yes. who is, uh, I don't think he was the initiative, uh, initiator of the GRACE program at All Souls, uh, Growing Racial and Cultural Equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I got it all. I think all. you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at All Souls. And they do meet um, every, uh, every third Thursday of the month, I believe, and, uh, and have been for quite a while. So how, what is it exactly is the connection between All Souls and, and your program? Have they just kind of taken it under their wing? Yes. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Yes. And... Um, it's certainly very much in their purview of social justice and service, so fits right in very nicely. Yeah, and you know, among the families who they go to All Souls, there are a lot of students in the New London public schools. Right, right. exactly. Well, let's go away from that for a minute and talk a little bit about STEAM. Um, I think it's become a, a more common term, you know, uh, what, seven, eight years ago, uh, even 10 years ago, we were learning all about STEM. It right. was almost like, for me, it felt almost like the, the 1960s all over <laughs> a, again that, um, you know, there was a real push for math and science education and, well, with a little addition of more technology this time around, but a real push for us to emphasize that. And then, um, Talk about the A. Well, it's the arts. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I forgot to mention that um, several music teachers and I started after school ukulele programs in oh, yeah? three of the schools. Now, do you play ukulele I too? Do. I do. I do. <laughs> and um, we always said if we can turn one child onto music, not as a professional, but as a um, enriching part of his or her life, it was worth it, and the kids loved it. The kids loved it. There was, there were always many more applicants than you know we were able to handle in the school. So, well, uh, what's really great is that there are some different you know music programs around. You know, there the community New London Community Orchestra does kids violin lessons. And right. There are some groups because. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, we talk about math and technology. There is, you know, evidence that says that a music education enhances m mathematical ability. It does. And if you think about it, it totally makes sense. Mm. You look at sheet music, you have the fractional That's right. Timing. The whole scale, and Pythagoras and the fifths yeah. and... Yeah. And, and, and what happens so often, uh, I think, with city schools especially, that are underfunded in the atmosphere of more and more standardized testing, that the arts are often what gets shortchanged. Very much so. I, sh I should uh, put out a, a thank you to IBM. Uh, I retired. IBM was my last, uh, uh, last job in my career. Loved it. And they uh, strongly encourage their employees and their retirees to volunteer. And if you do certain things, they will provide a stipend for your program. They funded the program in Danbury uh, over the years, a uh, total of $17,000. So we bought risers for the music program. We bought ukuleles. We bought... Uh, uh, a lot of things for the schools. Uh, the one school needed painting. Mm -hmm. The teachers came in and said, we'll paint the whole school. We bought the paint. 
everybody won. And uh, so. Well, that, that gets me thinking. One thing we try to do with these shows is like, give people ideas for how they can become involved with whatever is happening in New London. And is there a place that, uh, in addition to volunteering, if, a, if individuals in the community or groups in the community <laughs> wanted to uh, donate money towards your program, uh, is there a mechanism for that in place well, yet? Uh, there is not. Uh, and uh, the big ingredient that we need for the program is volunteer times. And there's no cost in doing that. Uh, what ended up happening, volunteers would say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll get you, uh, I'll get all the kids, uh, I'll buy all the kids a book for Christmas or um, I'll donate this for your classroom. So it was more kind of ad hoc, one on one, but there's no funding required to get it going. We just have, to have somebody, hey, I want to come and help. So really, mostly you need people to just raise their hands and volunteer. Exactly. Okay, um, the plan for 2019 uh, will, uh, so really recruiting uh, volunteers to serve about two hours a week. What kind of numbers of volunteers do you feel as though you need to get it off the ground? Oh, a half a dozen would let us get started. I'd like to see closer to a dozen. Now, do you plan to start more in the, the younger grades yeah, of yeah. the school and then expand upward and older as you get more volunteers? Yeah, yes, uh, there are a couple volunteers already at the school that are doing a wonderful job, and I think they're both in kindergarten, so there might be another volunteer or two at that level, but first, second, third grade, but really focusing on their educational foundation. And thinking about the nuts and bolts of it a little bit, uh, this slide says, you know, having had volunteers identify days and times they have available, who does the scheduling? Does that fall on you? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's no big deal. They say, look, I'm available Tuesday afternoons and Thursday mornings. And we go to the school, see what the needs are in the classroom, and balance out the volunteers according to their availability in, in the classroom. And then, um, you know, the, the school is responsible to figure out who's a good fit for which classroom, I'm exactly, guessing. Exactly, exactly. And the last couple of things on this, and we'll have to give up the computer in just a couple minutes, sure. um, is you know, scheduling uh, orientations and then planning for expansions. And, um, you know, Bob, if you want to take the computer, you can. I, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what kind of orientation is involved in, the, in this? If, if someone is watching this and is interested and comes to your event at All Souls at 7 o'clock on Thursday, right. um, what's the next step that, that they would expect if, if, if they sign a list and say they're interested? Well, they'll get certainly some exposure to the nature of the program of what would be expected. But when we have people that, are, that have committed to start, then we'll have... Uh, several sessions, we'll go over what uh, our volunteer guide, what's involved, how do you work with the teacher, how do you work with the kids, when this happens, what do you do? And so they feel comfortable that they've got some guidance on how, how to proceed. We actually do the same thing with the teachers based yeah. upon all the experience that we had in Danbury. So we're taking that template, that experience, and sharing that, and that's that's the template for a successful program. Now you mentioned that about 20% of your volunteers were retired teachers. Right. So I'm guessing, well, they might need slightly different orientation. I don't want to say less because things have changed. And, yeah. um, and, and as a, a former teacher, I, I feel like go, coming into someone else's classroom would have its own challenges. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but. Um, you know, I, I'm guessing volunteers come from all walks of life. They do. So how do you, it, has that presented any challenges or is it more like an opportunity to just get diverse viewpoints in there? Well, and each volunteer 
with their teacher, two unique individuals, work out what is a good working relationship between the two of them. And we have a little guidance on how to do that. But it's very much a human yeah. endeavor uh, with all its... Now, of your volunteers, you mentioned something about how you know, there aren't many men in elementary school classes these days. Do you manage to recruit a lot of men to volunteer? Not as many as we'd like, but we, we had a sprinkling of men, maybe so 10%, 12%. So a special call out maybe to men to do it. I'm guessing yes. uh, many of them don't even think that they might really enjoy and be good at it. Uh, I, I, that's true. Uh, we had some come in with some talent. Well, I'm not sure. I'm, but the minute they're in, I mean, they are in. They love it because they're, number one, so appreciated by the uh, students and the, and the teacher. They have a caring male presence in the classroom. So, Yeah, I think it's great my, myself. Men are a little bit different with children than women are, too. And for a few years in my uh, classroom, I had a male aide, uh -huh. and it was like the best couple of years I, I had. The, I don't know why, but the relationship is just different. Uh, and I think that's complimentary. It's really yeah, tender. it is. Yeah. It, it, now, um, what I wanted to ask you uh, now for the kickoff on Thursday, um, that starts at 7, but it, it's fairly long, so what, what is the program going to be for that? Uh, I'm going to go through the slideshow in depth, and uh, Myrna's going to speak, and then the principal and vice principal are going to be there, and they're going to speak, and then we're going to open it up for questions and Q&A, and, &A and, and uh, um, ask people who are interested to at least give us their name and number. And those are really serious about joining the program. When are you free? Tuesday <laughs> afternoon, Thursday morning. You know, yeah, great. We'll, you know, we'll uh, we'll get organized and we'll give you a call and you can start. Well, maybe it's premature for me to ask this, but you know, this year you're thinking Harbor School, and I'm guessing fall 2019, the um, the focus will still probably be on Harbor School. Are there hopes of expanding to more schools oh, looking into the future? We, we want to start this program, declare victory, let the results of the program be known uh, by the uh, school district. And certainly they'd love to see uh, other schools, additional volunteers. And then hopefully get some good local press. I mean, this program is one wonderful example, get some press in the day, and, and uh, what we found in Danbury, I suspect we'd find here, there's really an untapped um, demand or motivation for programs like this. Any chance you'll get the press to come to your, your event on Thursday? Um, I don't know, Mike, Mike was going to work on that, we'll see what happens. Well, yeah, I, I would hope, and if not, uh, as there are volunteers in, in the schools, I really do hope that, uh, that, that the press does cover it. It would help find volunteers as well. But we're down to our last uh, three minutes. So maybe just let people know how to get in touch with All Souls if they're interested in more information. And um, hopefully some of people will show up on Thursday. Yeah. Um, if they can't come on Thursday, there's the phone number. Um, uh, give a call. The uh, office will get in contact with me and I in turn will get back to them or they can send an email to All Souls and uh, we'll get in touch and see what we can do. That sounds great. Thank you so much for being on the show, Charlie. I'm really kind of excited. I never heard of this program before and I'm glad to see it coming to New London. Uh, next week, um, everyone who's watching probably knows we have a special election uh, scheduled mm -hmm. in the north part of New London, um, Districts 1 and 2 on February 26th to fill a vacancy for our state representative. 
Um, Myrna Martinez is one of the individuals running for the seat, and she will be my guest next week, and um, we'll be welcoming call, calls in and uh, talk about what her plans would be in Hartford. So sorry we're going back on a little bit of a political side for a couple of weeks, but then we'll be back and just talk about the uplifting things happening in our community. So. Um, We'll see you next week and uh, hope that people can come to All Souls on Thursday. And thanks again, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, yeah, mom.